We're not God. And God is trying to be so gentle with us like eggs in a basket. And out of his love, he's, he's saying to us, guys, listen, I, I, know, I know I created you, but you're not me. And you can't do this the way you think you could do it. And we're stubborn. And that's part of understanding the calling is that there's truth involved in this. Because of God's great love, he wants every person to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Not just a few, but everyone. 1 Timothy 2.4. God, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants you to understand. He's, he's, he's not willing. He's not. You know what? This is where you see a God of love. Bob said to be something yesterday. Bob's listening to the sermons on YouTube, on, on, the, on the Internet. And he says, you know what a lot of preachers don't preach about, Pastor? I said, what's that? He said, hell. And he's right. Jesus spoke about hell more than any other subject. And I said, when, I fin when, I'm, when I'm at the end of these sermons, I said, the last one will be about hell. He said, good deal, Pastor. Okay. I said, yeah. Because we don't. You see, and, and God in his love has to be who he is. He's sovereign. And there is a penalty for sin. And that penalty is hell eternally. Now, why people say, well, if he's, he's a God of love, he, he won't send people to hell. Guess what? He's tried for thousands of years not to. He's been patient. His word says he's been patient. He's been saying, you know, my grandson, a couple of summers ago, we had at the Parks Pond, we had uh, VBS, and he was acting up. And I, I don't know about you, maybe it's because I was never allowed to do it in a family of eight kids with my father, but when a, when a, when a grandchild or a child looks up in your face and goes, no, <laughs> Whoa, it's like a red flag. Okay, so he stood there, and he told his grandmother, no. And you know what grandma does? Papa, Nana yells, Papa, those are those words. Papa looks up, and this is grandson. Mm. Come here. No. Oh, you, you've gone too far now. And let's go outside. We're going to settle this privately, not where everybody can see, because I don't want to embarrass you any more than you need to be. And when I got him to the door, he refused to go. So with a little gentle help, <laughs> out the door he went and around the building, and he got what for on the seat of his pants. But then I put my arm around him and said, I love you. And the way you're acting is not the way we're supposed to act. And that's why Papa is doing this, to get your attention. And you know what? Every now and then, Papa will look at him. One night, we sent him away from the table and said, go into your bed, nothing to eat. Well, he did. So I couldn't sit there and eat. I got up from the table. I went in especially with Nana looking at me, you're so mean. So I go in the bedroom, close the door, and I sit on the bed with him, and I talk to him. And you know what? We sat there, and we talked, and I said, do you want us to eat? And then, let's go back to the table. And we came back to the table together. And I didn't have to spank him. But you know, the problem is that some of us still don't get it. And we grow up not getting it. And if you don't believe me, Go down to the Penobscot County Jail. I'll show you a lot of people that don't get it. And even in a society, if you want to take God out of the society, they still don't get it. So it's even beyond the God thing, if that was possible, but it's not. Because God's in control of everything. He's our God. He loves us. So he doesn't want any of us to, to, to uh, perish without knowing him. So the, for, under calling, first thing is everybody matters to God. The second point, and remember what Jesus said, by the way, John 8, 32, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free, and that's the truth, that everybody matters to God. The second point under, under uh, our calling is that believers are predestined, listen to this, believers are predestined to salvation. There's a wedding feast of the king. The king's having this wedding feast. And he's calling the people, and, and he sent this invitation to all these high mucky mucks. You know, he sent it to the, 
to the governor and to the first selectmen and to, to all the senators and all the representatives of the country. He sent it to all these people. And guess what? Nobody showed up. So he, he sent out his people to go invite them, tell them to come. We're all busy. We're all busy. We've got things to do. This is kind of like the other parable where I just bought me a cow and married a wife. When we were kids at camp, we used to sing that backwards. I just bought a wife and married a cow. But, you know, we, we, and then somebody catches doing it and says, stop singing that song like that. Stop singing that song. But it's like that parable. And nobody wanted to come because they were too busy doing our own thing. All right, God, I, I know you got a heaven or a hell, and I know you're waiting, and I know you want me to have, but I'm, I'm busy right now, okay? And that's what we do in our lives. Instead of having times of devotion and spending times talking to him and coming to, to meetings and getting together and fellowshipping and building up the spirit of God within our lives, we're too busy. And you know, in my life, the way I see that sometimes is with my kids. I hear from them once in a while. Their lives are busy. You want them to be around more often. Sometimes you don't. I always say, with, especially with the grandkids, the best thing about grandkids are taillights. When you see their parents taking them away, you know, and there they go. Three, you know, fish and relatives, three days, and they both start to smell. But, you know, we have family. We're close and connected but we really do want to be together. I want to be with the kids. And the kids don't want to. They want to go their own way. And God created us, and we want to do our own thing. Back to the garden again. When God came looking for Adam and Eve in the garden, where were they? Ah, uh, we're hiding. <laughs> okay. They're hiding from God. Why? Um, we're naked. <laughs> we're naked. Oh, who told you you were naked? Well, and then, they, and then the story comes out, huh? All the lying and the, and the fumbling. And, and that's what we do in our lives. And if we're not believers, if we haven't answered the call of God in our lives, our lives sometimes are miserable. And we wonder why. You must have relatives that sometimes when things are going wrong, they could care less about God have no concern about anybody else in the family or man. And as soon as they've got a problem, guess what they do? They email you or they call you, please pray for me. Please what? Please pray for me. Well, pray for you, why? Well, we're going through the other But wait a minute, what do, you, what do you want? You want God's help? You don't want anything to do with God. Now all of a sudden, why do you want his help? And some of us do that. We spiritually run around waiting for those emergencies and we look for the little spiritual break glass pull alarm. You ever see those little red boxes, the old fire boxes? Break glass pull alarm. Now we got an emergency in our lives. And God doesn't operate that way. Believers are predestined. And in this wedding parable that we hear, we see finally they go back out, they bring the people in, and as the people come in, they're given wedding clothes. Now, if you're not doing anything else this afternoon, if you're not doing anything else today, you can go to Matthew 22 and verses 1 to 14 and read this parable. People came in that weren't invited originally. Anybody, they came in from the street, good and bad. What that is a symbol of, well, I won't go deep into the parable. What that's a symbol of is that anybody can come to Jesus. But you've got to be willing to accept Jesus on God's terms, not our terms. In fact, in the parable, the king walks into the room and there's one person not dressed or robed the way he's supposed to be, and he got thrown out. And Jesus says at the end of the parable, he says, many are called, but few are chosen. When we come, we can't come on our own terms. We have to come on God's terms. We have to come as God wants us to come. And Jesus calls the chosen for the reason that he, they are the ones that made the right decision. And they responded to a choice opportunity. And the, cre the king had not predetermined the decisions of those who turned down the invitation or for those who accepted it. So that's a little hard to understand. But did God tell you to be a believer? No, he Gave you the opportunity to be a believer. And it's your choice. 
and we don't know who's going to make the, the choice or not. God does. You know why? He's God. He knows who's, and that's why when he says those who he, for he, he foreknew, he knew he would, who would answer the call. He knew that you would respond. He's God. And there's no way he can't know. In fact, Paul describes believers as those who are called, called according to God's purpose. Just like the wedding banquet. Bring them in. The king's going to have a banquet. We're going to celebrate my son's wedding. I don't care what happens. And he calls them in. In fact, he adds, Paul adds uh, in, in Romans 8, 28, for those who God foreknew, he also predestined. In other words, the ones he knew would answer, whoever they were, he predestined, in other words, had a place for them at the wedding. And for those he predestined, he called, justified, and glorified. How did he justify? By giving us the righteousness of Christ. By giving us what Jesus died for. Remember, last week we talked about Christ being our propitiation. Jesus died for us. So now, we've been justified. Because we're wearing the righteousness. And remember that song I told you we used to sing as kids? Oh, the best thing in my life I ever did do. Oh, the best thing in my life I ever did do. Oh, the best thing in my life I ever did do was take off the old coat and put on the new. Oh, the old coat was dirty, all tattered and torn. But the new coat was spotless, had never been worn. And what they would do in some of these customs is that when the people came, the guests came, they would be given a nice robe wedding garment to sit at the wedding everybody looked adorned and that's what God does for us in Christ Jesus we get to wear the righteousness of Jesus Christ because he did he died for us now under calling here's your third point God chooses individuals for ministry for ministry God chooses the people when he calls them he chooses the people for ministry too we are all called to a royal priesthood first point we are all called to a royal priesthood priesthood. While we may say God does not choose individuals for salvation, but wants all to accept his invitation and be saved, we can say that he chooses individuals for a specific task. In fact, Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 is a per perfect example of that, as he tells us that certain people are called to perform certain tasks for God's purpose. Some people are called to be pastor teachers, some people are called to, were called to be apostles. Some were called to be prophets. Some are called to be organists. And, and, and whatever administration job you have within the body of Christ, people are called to do that. But each one of you is called to be a priest. A priest in the sense that you come to God for yourself, one-on-one. -on -one. If you've got a problem, I can't intervene. I can pray for you. But it's between you and God, and God and you have to work that out. I can't go on your behalf. I can pray a lot for you, and sometimes as the situation comes along, I can pray harder for you. But I can't change that. You're a priest unto yourself before God, and you have a high priest that you answer to, and that's Jesus Christ. He is our high priest, our mediator, as it says, before God the Father. Now, 